We're so thankful uh, again to Martin County Library to have have us be able to have our coastal lecture series here. It's it's so great to have a, a lecture where we've got so many great topics, and Zach has been doing a fantastic job to put together great speakers, and tonight is one of those great speakers. <laughs> I want I get the privilege of introducing Zach. Um, Dr. Zach Judd is our uh, director of education at Florida Ocean Graphic Society, but he's also he's a marine ecologist whose research is focused and on the interface between the marine game fish and the human disturbances um, in their coastal ecosystems. Uh, Zach holds a PhD in biology from Florida International University and a master's degree in marine biology from Florida Institute of Technology. Much of his research has been carried out in the Florida's Indian River Lagoon and estuary and it's all of its tributaries like the St. Lucie River estuary a system that um, has suffered with massive degradation uh, in recent years and currently is undergoing some siege, which he'll talk about before his talk. But during his nine years with Florida Oceanographic, Zach has worked diligently to try to bridge the gap that between uh, the scientific community and the public through our education programs and developing outreach and educational programs, even, even different virtual programs. Uh, he's done programs that I, on turtles out to people in Singapore or Alaska or all these things. I, it's amazing how, how much outreach Zach does. Uh, to this end, he's given dozens of lectures throughout Florida. He's appeared in numerous documentaries, television shows, short films, and news stories. Uh, as an avid fly angler and also as a scuba diver, Zach is personally vested in the health of Florida's waters. I want you to help me welcome Zach Judd. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you, Mark, for the wonderful introduction. It's always a little bit awkward to introduce yourself. So thank you for taking that off of my plate. Uh, I am so grateful to see a fantastic crowd here tonight. I say that every week, but I mean it even more so tonight because I'm giving the presentation. So it's nice to see a, a fantastic turnout at the Blake. I know we've got a bunch of people watching from home on Zoom. I've got my iPad up here. Hi, everybody at home. Thank you for making this lecture series a success. As I've said time and time again, we would not be able to have these lectures without having such a wonderful audience. And it really is you guys that make this series a success. Now, we have a wonderful, stable audience of folks who come week after week, and I appreciate all of you. But it seems like each week we also have a number of folks who've come for your very first Coastal Lecture Series. So can I see by a show of hands, how many of you are here for your very first one of these? Fantastic. Well, for all of you who are first timers, and I'm sure there were some more hands that went up on Zoom, right? For those of you who are watching your very first Coastal Lecture Series, I wanna let you know that we still have three more left this year. So the next three Tuesdays, we have some, some more lectures for you to attend. There's a schedule on the back table. I would encourage you to grab that on your way out because you might be interested in some of the ones that we already held earlier in the year. All of our lectures are recorded and those recordings end up on the Florida Oceanographic Society website. So for those of you who are new to our series, please head home. Check out the ones we have online and get caught up. There's definitely some great programs that I think you'll enjoy. Now, one week from tonight, we have our next lecture. That's gonna be February 27th, and it's gonna feature Sarah Ayers Rigsby. She's the Southeast and Southwest Regional Director for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. I forgot I have slides behind me tonight. This is different. Next week, Sarah is going to be sharing with us an archaeological, a geological, and a cultural history of the Florida Everglades. The earliest inhabitants of Florida had a profound influence on the land that sustained their civilization. So Sarah's presentation will look at the role that early Native Americans played in the formation of tree islands and how humans are now continuing to shape the Everglades as we know it. This is a really important topic because those tree islands that she's gonna talk about have been heavily impacted by flooding as a result of the mismanagement of water flowing through the Everglades. So this is gonna be a fantastic presentation and I hope to see all of you here. And uh, if you're watching from home on Zoom and you can make it to the Blake, come on out in person, join us here. I know, I know it's easy to watch from home, but we really love having a full house here at the library as well. So we also have some not so good news for you. As I alluded to last week, 
the Army Corps has in fact started dumping on us. This is aerial footage of what the St. Lucie River looks like right now. And this is not good. The reason it's not good is because these discharges will have a substantial impact on the health of our estuary. We are looking at today over 1.8 billion gallons of water pouring out of the SAD flood control structure and into the South Fork of the St. Lucie. The salinity changes that this water will create will kill what seagrass is left in our estuary. It will affect the oyster reefs that are clinging onto existence. It will affect the game fish and sport fish that make our area so special. And on top of that, we have to think about toxic cyanobacteria. Right now, there is not an active bloom of microcystis in Lake Okeechobee. But I want to remind everybody, last year, the first signs of cyanobacteria pouring out of the lake occurred at the end of February. So what used to be a summertime problem is becoming a, almost a year-round problem, and we need to keep our eye on that. So we've got this horrible situation that's unfolding in front of us right now. We don't know when it's going to end. In all likelihood, it's going to continue looking like this for months to come. So what do we do about it? Take your phone out right now. Go ahead, take your phone out. And all you have to do is turn your camera on. You don't even have to take a picture. Just hold your phone up with the camera on. This will pop up. There will be a little link at the top. Click on the link. It will send you to Florida Oceanographic Society's advocacy website. On that website, you can join our advocacy update email. You can learn about the discharges. We put regular updates on there so you can stay on top of that. And most importantly, you can join our call to action. You can fill out a form that we have on the advocacy website to send an email directly to Colonel Booth from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Chauncey Goss, the director of the board of the South Florida Water Management District, demanding that they stop these discharges and not allow them to happen again in the future. I'll put this up again at the end of the talk. If you guys didn't have a chance to make it work, I can help walk you through it. But this is the most important way that you can stay up to date right now. Florida Oceanographic Society will be your eyes and ears over the next couple of months. We will let you know what's happening on the St. Lucie. And this is your interface with our organization. Now we get to talk about something that I love, fish. So usually at this point, I leave the stage and I introduce somebody else. Tonight, I'm so excited that I get to stay up here with you for the next couple of minutes and talk about something that at face value might not seem that interesting, fish courtship and reproduction. But I promise you what we're going to talk about tonight is pretty interesting. And I hope you all leave with a new appreciation of just how unusual fish behavior is compared to other organisms that we might be a little bit more familiar with. First things first, fish anatomy is not the same as mammalian anatomy, especially on the outside. They do not have the same external reproductive anatomy that you're used to thinking of in the world of mammals. So let's do a quick brief dive into the anatomy of fish. First, male fish and female fish have internal reproductive organs called gonads. So male fish have testes, female fish have ovaries. Those internal gonads are connected to the outside of the fish's body through a very simple opening called a urogenital opening. It's nothing fancy. It's just a hole in the fish's abdominal wall. So that is where eggs come out. That's where sperm comes out. And it's also the spot where the fish urinates out of. So it's sort of a multi-purpose opening. And that's literally all it is. Now, there are some fish that have a little bit of a fleshy bump around that opening called a genital papilla. And then there are some fish that have a little straw or tube that will come out called a um, ovipositor. And they use those for egg laying. But by and large, there's not much on the outside of a fish that would tell us whether it's a male or a female. It's what's on the inside. Because of this anatomical structure, most fish utilize external fertilization. Rather than mating, the fish lay their eggs into the water, the males release their sperm into the water. Fertilization occurs outside of the fish's body. And we have a name for that. That's called ovoparity. It's also called egg laying, if you don't want to be very fancy. And in the world of oviparous fish, there are some that lay their eggs up in the water. Those are called pelagic spawning fish. And there are some that lay their eggs down on the bottom. Those are demersal spawning fish. So in this image, we see three coho salmon that are spawning. The greener fish is the female. The two red fish are males. 
and the cloud that you see is sperm that the males are releasing. If anybody in the front has good vision, you might be able to see a few eggs drifting back as well. They're kind of a peach or orange color. This is an example of external fertilization, and it's demersal because it's happening on the bottom rather than up in the water column. Now, in the marine fish world, most species are pelagic spawners. Not all of them, but most of them. They spawn up in the water, not near the bottom. Some pelagic spawners reproduce as pairs. So they form a little pair bond, and, and they end up reproducing as a couple. It's kind of cool. Usually, that's a short-term pair bond, but there are certain species that form a longer bond, and, and they'll be seen together. If anybody's done any scuba diving, you've probably seen in Florida French angelfish or gray angelfish hanging out as pairs. Those are breeding pairs, and every night, those pairs probably reproduce pelagically up in the water column. These are conspic angelfish, a, a, a very rare type of angelfish that utilizes the same system. They form a pair bond, and at night, they make a little bit of a, a spawning rise. They swim up in the water column, and the male releases his, his sperm, the female releases her eggs, and they're done with it. But the cool thing is, because they're not investing a lot in the future of their offspring, they're able to invest a lot in the eggs themselves. They make tons of eggs. Fish like this, they're, they're about that big, so they're not a real big fish. They can make tens of thousands of eggs per day. A big fish, like a big grouper, can produce more than a million eggs per spawn. But the eggs are tiny. Pelagic spawning fish have eggs that are not much bigger than a grain of sand. That's good from the fish's perspective because they're easy to make. They can make lots and lots of them. It is also good from a dispersal perspective. These little tiny eggs float up to the surface. You can see the little round circles in these images. Those circles are oil globules, oils less dense than water, and that allows those eggs to float up to the surface where ocean currents can carry them and spread them out. They hatch into extremely tiny, tiny larvae. This is a freshly hatched angelfish larva. It doesn't even look like a fish. It doesn't have eyeballs. It doesn't have fins. It doesn't have a mouth yet. After these little fish hatch, they undergo more development as they grow, and during this stage, they're incredibly vulnerable. Yes, they're able to spread far and wide riding on the ocean's currents, but the problem is they're also getting eaten by every other little organism during that period of time. So the benefit of pelagic spawning is that the fish are able to produce just an unbelievable amount of eggs on a day-to-day -day basis. The downside is that those eggs are very fragile, very tiny, and they're pretty easily gobbled up. So the survival rate for this type of spawning is relatively low, but when you think about the millions of eggs that are produced on a given reef, the overall number of offspring that make it is fairly high. They also are able to spread from one reef to the next. And that's important for certain fish species because you know, there might not be a big population on one reef, but by, by having larvae that drift with the water, those, those babies are able to get out into new areas and repopulate. This is also how oysters spread. Some of you know that Florida Oceanographic Society is invested in oyster restoration. They are broadcast spawners as well. The female and male oysters release their eggs and sperm into the water. The larvae drift, and they can get far, far away from where their parents are to settle into new areas. And that's how oyster reef restoration works. So that's a story of broadcast spawners that hang out as pairs. But in, honestly, in honesty, most marine fishes breed in big groups that we call aggregations. Now, a spawning aggregation might be a couple dozen fish, might be a couple hundred fish. I'll show you in a minute a spawning aggregation that has thousands of individual fish in it. And the idea here is by coming together in a known spot at a known time, you have a much higher chance of bumping into a mate. Like, you have a pretty good guarantee of bumping into a mate. And that's one of the reasons why fish utilize spawning aggregations. The fish that spawn in these aggregations are still pelagic spawners. So the same rules apply. Teeny tiny eggs, teeny tiny larvae, not a lot of investment from the parents. The eggs are able to drift and spread really far, but their survival rate is pretty low. The spots that fish choose to spawn for an aggregation are critical. And the location that they pick is not random. It's a spot that has just the right ocean currents to allow those eggs and larvae to drift and make it back to where they need to be. And one of the cool things about a spawning aggregation is how far the fish will come to join up at that spot. There are examples of fish that travel over 100 miles 
These are solitary fish. Normally, if you see one scuba diving, you just see one. But they know that at certain times of year, during certain moon phases, all of the individuals of their species within 50 or 100 miles are gathering at one spot to reproduce. And they follow their natural urge and they go. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a spawning aggregation that I got to work on before I took my job at Florida Oceanographic Society. It's actually a funny story. When I applied for this job, I told Mark, you know, I'm submitting my application, but you're not gonna be able to reach me for the next week or two because I'm gonna be on a lobster boat in the Bahamas studying bonefish. So of course I get back off the boat and thankfully I had a very promising email to, to respond to and that's, you know, how I ended up here, but that was the culmination of a multi-year study that I got to participate in that was led by a nonprofit called Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Bonefish and Tarpon Trust is a Florida organization and their focus is on protecting game fish like bonefish and tarpon and permit and also the habitats that they live in. The goal of this multi-year project was to figure out where and how bonefish reproduce. We had heard rumors that they might make spawning aggregations, but nobody had ever seen one. And in the entire first year of our study, we didn't see one either. But at the last day of our second year, my colleague, Dr. Aaron Adams, and I jumped in the water at the very end of our last day and swam up to a school of like 20,000 bonefish. And it was an amazing experience. And in the years following that, we went back each spawning season around the new and full moons in the fall, winter, and early spring. We slowly learned more about this process. And the way we did that was by putting tracking tags inside of the bonefish. The first thing we learned is that some of these fish were coming from dozens, if not 100 miles away, to reproduce. So all of the bonefish from this particular island were gathering in one spot. That makes that spot very vulnerable. If somebody were to go in and harvest all of those bonefish, you wouldn't just wipe out the bonefish that live at that spawning spot. You would wipe out all of the bonefish in the spots where those fish had just come from. So Spawning aggregations are very vulnerable to fishing pressure, both legal fishing and also in the Bahamas, uh, they experience a lot of illegal fishing where a boat from another country might come in and put a big net down and catch all of the fish in a spawning aggregation like this. The, the other thing that we noticed is that there was a very specific signature to the type of spot where these spawning aggregations occur. They were generally rocky areas with a lot of current and they were in close proximity to deep water. Now, for those of you who don't know what a bonefish is, they are a shallow water species. They usually live in a foot or two of water up in the seagrass beds and near the mangroves. But when they spawn, they gather in slightly deeper water, five to 10 feet, and they hang out for a few days and they get to know each other and they circle around. And then on the night that they're actually ready to spawn, they do something incredible. So I have a video to show you here. This is a school of about 10,000 bonefish. And I, I can't express to you how amazing it is to sit here and swim in this. At sunset, those fish start to move from 10 or 15 feet of water out to 30 or 40 feet of water, but they stay near the surface. And you'll see, they start jumping out of the water and, and they're porpoising and breaching. And we believe what they're doing is swallowing air. They're bringing air either into their stomach or their swim bladder, and there's a reason for that. Right at sunset, all of that jumping stops and the fish begin a journey offshore. If we didn't have tracking tags in them, they would just disappear. But because we had tracking tags that had a depth sensor inside of some of these fish, we were able to see what they were doing, even though they were invisible to our eyes. And what we found was amazing. The fish would start to swim offshore, and very quickly they would dive. They would dive as far as 180 plus feet underwater, and they stayed down there for more than two hours. And I say 180 plus, the tags that we used maxed out at 180 feet. We have no idea how much deeper they went. This is a fish that you'd normally find in two feet of water. And here they are 200 feet deep in an area that's almost 2,000 feet below them. This is open water spawning for a species that's not at all an open water fish. And then after two hours, they shot back up. In a minute, they went from 180 feet to 100 feet. That's called a spawning rise. A lot of pelagic spawning fish make that rise as they're laying their eggs and releasing their sperm. We developed a theory. We think that the fish were swallowing air into their body and as they dove, that air compressed. While they were at depth, their eggs 
fertilized, and, or not fertilized, they, they hydrated, uh, they matured, they absorbed water, and they swelled. As the fish began swimming up very quickly, the air in their body expands, and it pneumatically assists the eggs on their way out. The male's right next to them, the male's testes release sperm, and that is how we think bonefish spawn. This work is the highlight of my career because it led to the creation of a national park to protect this particular spawning site. One of the things we noticed is that the bonefish spawning site had other fish spawning there at different times of year. So we know that bonefish spawn during certain months, but if you went back to that same spot in different months, the Nassau grouper would spawn there, or the hogfish, or the mangrove snapper would spawn there. So we found that site to be critical, not just for bonefish, but for a whole uh, bunch of different fish species that were critical to the economy of the Bahamas, and that's why it led to a national park. I showed you a picture earlier of an angelfish larva. I'm gonna show you now what bonefish larva look like. This is not a bonefish larva, it's a ladyfish larva, but it looks exactly like a bonefish larva. Fish in this particular family have a bizarre larval form called a leptocephalus. Bonefish, tarpon, and ladyfish, and eels have this really weird ribbon-like larva. This one looks pretty white because of the lighting I used to photograph it. In real life, they are as clear as the water is. All you see are their eyeballs swimming around. They're amazing. And they're only found in these very primitive fishes. So compared to that angelfish larva, a bonefish larva looks nothing like it, but it also looks nothing like a bonefish. Like a caterpillar, these larvae undergo a metamorphosis where very quickly they go from this ribbon-like leptocephalus to a little tiny tarpon or a little tiny bonefish or a little tiny ladyfish. They shrink in the process, and as they shrink, they start to look more like the fish that they're, they're eventually going to become. So I've got another really good example of fish that spawn in aggregations, the Nassau grouper. Nassau grouper are a big grouper. They're critically, critically important to the ecology and the economy of the Caribbean. They're a very important food fish, and unfortunately, they've been heavily overfished over the last 50 or 60 years. And one of the reasons they're overfished is because they spawn in aggregations, and people figured out that if you go to the aggregation site, you can catch all the fish. And if you do that for enough generations, there aren't any fish left. And one of the things that we've learned is that these fish find their way to the aggregating site by following older fish. It's called social learning. If you're a young Nassau grouper and you just reach maturity, you have no idea where the spawning spot is. But some of the other bigger grouper in your general area will lead you to that site. But if you catch and kill all of the fish at a spawning aggregation, you lose that biological memory. And now, there aren't any fish to lead the next generation back. So a significant percentage of Nassau grouper spawning sites in the Caribbean no longer have Nassau grouper. Thankfully, a little over 20 years ago in Little Cayman, a pretty healthy Nassau grouper spawning site was identified. And another nonprofit, uh, Reef, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation, they're, they're located in the Keys, they began researching these grouper as part of a project called the Grouper Moon Project. And for the last 21 or 22 years, they've been working closely with scientists in the Cayman Islands and scientists from universities around the country to protect and document and study this spawning aggregation. And one of the neat things that you'll notice in this picture is there's a bunch of different color fish. Nassau grouper, if you see one when you're out diving on a normal day, they all look the same. They're a beige fish with kind of brown vertical bars. They look like that one. But when they gather into a spawning aggregation, they develop three other color patterns. Some of them look like that, but they've got a, a lighter belly. And then there are some that get solid dark brown. And then there are others that get solid dark brown with a white belly. When they hit that stage of being solid dark brown with a white belly, the scientists know that they're probably gonna spawn within a day or two. And remember earlier I said that certain fish spawn every single day, like the angelfish? Fish like this, it's a much shorter window of time. They gather at this aggregating site, and within a couple of days, they, they, most of them will spawn. This is happening 
right now. This is a wintertime thing. It just wrapped up for the year. Unlike bonefish that will spawn multiple times during the winter and fall and spring, Nassau grouper, it, it's a really specific time. So the scientists have used this, this color change to know when they should be in the water to document the moment of spawning. And I've got a video. This is from Reef's Facebook page. And it will show you what the spawning looks like. So first, you'll see the fish kind of swimming around. Up here, I feel like I'm diving right now. I feel like I'm in this. And it's low light because it's evening. Most marine fish spawn right at sunset. I forgot to mention that. And what you're going to see, see the white bellies? What you're going to see is a group of these fish rising and releasing eggs and sperm in the water. That was a spawning rise. They don't all do it at once. A little cluster will do it. And then a few minutes later, another little cluster will do it. So if you watch, we'll see it again here. Here's another little cluster that's going to swim up, and they're going to release their eggs and sperm in the water, and then go back down. Here's a scientist with Reef coming in with a plastic bag to collect some of the eggs and sperm. I have a friend who has chickens. We get to benefit from their eggs. I guess this is kind of similar, collecting eggs from grouper. But they do that for scientific research. Here's another example. This is a bumphead parrotfish. You can see there's a lot of parrotfish in this aggregation, but there's just maybe seven or eight or nine of them that are doing a spawning rise and releasing eggs and sperm in the water. So this is a common trait. Fish like this spawn right around sunset. Their eggs float to the surface, and they disperse far and wide. So remember, pelagic spawning fish, not a lot of investment from the parents, tons and tons of eggs, but really teeny tiny eggs that have a fairly low chance of survival. There's another fish in our part of Florida that I love, the snook. They form spawning aggregations as well. This is a video I took when I was doing snook research in Jupiter Inlet, where the Loxahatchee River, the southern end of the Indian River Lagoon, spills out into the Atlantic. And you can see that I'm literally swimming through a school of five or 600 big snook. Every summer, snook from all around the Treasure Coast migrate to our inlets. They go to Jupiter Inlet, St. Lucie Inlet, Fort Pierce Inlet, Sebastian Inlet, and they hang out in these big aggregations at sunset particularly on outgoing tides. The males and females will rise in little groups and they'll spawn. I, I couldn't find the video. I tried to find it. I've seen this a few times when I'm out fishing right at sunset on an outgoing tide. You'll see a ball of these snook flashing and rolling on the surface. Their tails are in the air. Their fins are in the air. That is the actual act of spawning. They're not a deep water fish, so they don't do a big ascent, but they still do rise up to the surface. As a pelagic spawner, they have teeny tiny eggs and teeny tiny larvae. In the case of snook, they try to spawn on the outgoing tide, so their eggs drift out into the ocean. The eggs hatch. They spend a few days floating around, and they develop fairly quickly. Bonefish have a long larval phase, 40 to 70 days drifting in the open ocean before that ribbon-like larva turns into a little bonefish. For snook, it's much quicker. It's a, maybe two to three weeks. And towards the end of that larval phase, the little babies ride an incoming tide back into our estuary where they take up residence in nursery habitats. Nursery habitats like seagrass beds and the edges of mangrove shorelines. Unfortunately, those nursery habitats are places that are being destroyed by Lake Okeechobee discharges, the clear cutting of mangroves, the death of our seagrasses. So this life cycle that's been going on for tens of thousands of years here in Florida is being impacted in our lifetimes by the way that water is being managed. So let's switch gears. So far, I've talked about pelagic spawning fish, the ones that spawn up in the water and just sort of forget about their eggs. There are other fish that are bottom spawning fish, demersal spawning fish, or benthic spawning fish. Some of those fish create nests. Others, they can't be bothered with that. So in this example, we've got some Chinook salmon that are spawning. They're not real good parents. They they'll kind of fan the gravel with their tail to loosen up the rocks and maybe wash away any sand or sediment. And then they spawn right into the gravel. You can see the, the sperm coming out of the male. The female, she's releasing eggs right now as well. You can't see it. They get down into the gravel. The fish might kick a few more times with their tail to, to cover the eggs up, and then that's it. They don't do anything else to guard those eggs. And in fact, in the case of Pacific salmon, what do they do next? They die. Yeah, this is it for them. It's their final gesture in life. But there are other fish that instead of just you know, making a nest in the bottom of the, the riverbed or the bottom of the seafloor, they, they add a little bit of a twist to it. And this is one of my favorite twists, the grunion. Grunion spawn on the bottom, but they do it out of the water. 
They literally gather by the millions along the coastline of California and, and northern Mexico. And they, they come to shore right after the new moon and the full moon, when the tides are extra high. And they ride those waves all the way up onto the beach. And then they wiggle even further. They want to get above the high tide line. And once they get up there, the female will wiggle into the sand. The male will wrap around her and he'll release his sperm around her body. It, it, the eggs will drop down into the sand itself. And then when they're done, they wiggle back out. Look in the background. See them all flipping back into the water? They go back into the ocean and they leave their eggs above the high tide line. They come out by the millions, and we think that this is one of the advantages of spawning in a large group, whether it's a grunion or a Nassau grouper or a bonefish. When you're all together at once, the predators that might eat you get overwhelmed. There's a lot of things that can eat a little grunion, but believe it or not, when we're swimming in an aggregation of bonefish, there are sharks and barracuda and even kubera snapper that will attempt to eat the spawning bonefish, but by being so densely packed together, it helps avoid predation. The same thing goes with their eggs, whether it's grunion or, or grouper. All of the eggs emerge at once, all of the babies hatch at once, and the predators that eat those small larvae get overwhelmed, and many of them end up making it. The eggs of the grunion stay above the high tide line for at least 10 days, and they don't hatch until the next moon phase brings a high tide up onto the beach, and that's what triggers hatching. If the next moon phase doesn't bring water far enough up, the eggs stay in a state of suspended animation under the sand and they don't hatch. They can wait for a few more weeks until the water gets high enough to cause them to hatch and wash back out to sea. So pretty cool story of a fish that lays its eggs out of the water. So I mentioned fish that nest but don't really do a great job of being parents. Thankfully, a lot of reef fish are very good parents. They nest on the bottom, so they're demersal nesters, but then they, they, they do some parental care. They guard the nest or they take care of the eggs as they, as they grow. And a great example of, of a, a demersal spawning species that takes care of its eggs is Nemo, the clownfish. Clownfish or anemone fish are, are part of the damselfish family, so lots of damselfish do this. Blennies do it, gobies do it. These marine fish are fastidious parents. They'll clear out a nesting site, they will lay their eggs on that site, and then they will work to protect those eggs through the incubation period, which is five to 10 days for an angelfish. Remember, a lot of those pelagic fish hatch in a day or two, but they're very poorly developed. Angelfish have tiny eggs. Damselfish have medium-sized eggs. Their eggs are quite a bit bigger. Um, not as big as a peppercorn, but maybe half as big as a peppercorn. They're, they're noticeable with the naked eye. By having bigger eggs and by having a longer development period, five to 10 days, there's a better chance that those babies will survive. But the trade-off is they can't make as many eggs. They might make a couple hundred eggs, not 10,000 or a million eggs. Even though they make less eggs per spawning bout and they can't spawn as often because, I mean, you can't spawn every night if you're guarding your babies for five to 10 days, the end result is still a robust hatching and fish that tend to survive better because they're so much bigger when they hatch. One of the downsides of this strategy is that the babies don't disperse as well. The reason that pelagic spawning fish disperse so well is because their babies are tiny. They just drift with the ocean currents. With bottom spawning fish that guard their nests, the babies pop out pretty big and they don't have the chance to spread far and wide. So a lot of clownfish babies will end up staying on the same reef that they were born in. I have another video to show you. This is what egg laying looks like. And I want you to look carefully. The female's the bigger fish. You'll see her ovipositor coming out of her belly. Keep looking, keep looking. Let's see, right? Right now, do you see the ovipositor coming out? She's using that to lay eggs on the nest site. So she'll lay a batch of eggs. And then I think of this like a crop dusting airplane. The male will come by and fertilize that group of eggs. And then she'll lay some more eggs, another row of eggs. And then the male will fertilize those and, and so on until she's all done laying the eggs that she has in her body at that moment. When they're all done, they will spend the incubation period carefully protecting and guarding that nest. You can see how big the eggs are compared to the little tiny eggs we looked at earlier. The clownfish 
will oxygenate the nest. They'll fan it with their fins to make sure sediment doesn't get on it. Most importantly, they will chase away predators. I know if you dive in this part of Florida, you have probably been chased by a damselfish at some point. We don't have clownfish here, but we have other damselfish that do the same thing. They're such good parents that they will come peck at you and they'll peck at your camera, they'll peck at your mask in an attempt to keep you away from their babies. The other thing they will do is pull out any eggs that aren't developing so those eggs don't make the other eggs sick. This is a very high investment. Even though they don't make as many eggs, they're still passing on their offspring in a, in a pretty high number because those babies tend to thrive and survive. So far tonight, I've talked about marine fish, but there's a couple of fun examples from the freshwater fish world as well. Here are betta fish or Siamese fighting fish. I have one on my kitchen counter. How many of you have one on your kitchen counter? Anybody have betta fish? A couple of you do. Betas have a unique way of mating. I, I'm lumping them in as bottom spawners because at some point the eggs do fall down to the bottom. They're not pelagic spawners. But during the process of spawning, well, let me just show you. This is a pair of betas that are spawning. The white one is the female, the red one is the male. And in a second, you're gonna see the eggs dropping. And as the eggs fall, the male will dive down to the bottom and pick them up. He has to be quick because if he's not, guess what the female will do? She eats them. So he'll grab the eggs and look, he floats up to the surface and he spits them into a bubble nest that he's built. When you have a pet beta and you see that white bubbly foam on the top, that is a nest that your male is building. He will then guard them until they hatch. And that helps increase the survival rate of those betas. I have one more freshwater fish story for you. Remember the grunion that laid their eggs out of the water? There's a freshwater fish called the splash tetra from South America that also lays its eggs out of the water, but in a way that's more similar to a tropical frog. You ever see like, like Planet Earth or the Blue Planet or any of those BBC type shows where the frogs lay their eggs on a leaf above a pond and then when the tadpoles hatch, they drip down into the water? The splash tetra does a very similar thing. These are little fish. They're only maybe an inch or two long. The male and female will find a spot where a leaf is dipping down right above the water. And somehow, in perfect synchrony, they will leap out of the water and grab the leaf with their fins. And they hold on for 10 or 15 seconds, releasing a few eggs, and the male then fertilizes them. And then they plop back down in the water. And then right after that, they jump back up again. And they, they do this over and over again until the leaf is covered with eggs. Now, fish eggs can't live out of the water very well. In the case of the grunion, the, the moisture in the sand keeps them alive. In the case of the splash tetra, as their name implies, the male, about once a minute, splashes water up on the leaf for their entire incubation period. When they hatch, the babies drip down in the water and that gives them their head start. All right, that's it for freshwater fish. Now, we get to a story that I think most of you probably know, but hopefully I can tell you a little bit more about it. A very unique way of guarding your babies that does not involve a nest. We call this brooding. An easy way to think of brooding is like nesting, but using your body as the nest. And seahorses are a classic example of brooders. These are two long snout seahorses. This is one of the three species of seahorse that are native to Florida. We used to see these all of the time in the Indian River Lagoon. One of the things that Florida Oceanographic Society does is lead seining field trips where we get students in the water with a long mesh net to scoop up the animals and talk about their importance and then of course let them go. When we had seagrass behind the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center, we'd catch seahorses all the time. Now that our seagrass is in decline, we don't see them as often. They're a prime example of a species that is intrinsically linked to healthy seagrass. In this case, we have a male and a female long snout seahorse. The male is on the left. And at the bottom of his abdomen, there is a brood pouch. The female doesn't have a brood pouch. Her abdomen ends abruptly. There's a little bump there. That's that genital papilla that we talked about. But she doesn't have a pouch for her eggs. When it's time for them to mate, the female lays her eggs into the male's brood pouch, and he carries out the pregnancy. Male seahorses are the ones that get pregnant. In that brood pouch, he provides oxygen to the offspring. And there's also a theory that they provide some nutrition for the offspring as well. Seahorses are really neat animals. And I, I, I hope that you'll take this home and appreciate that 
We have these in our community. In addition to the long snout seahorse, we also have lined seahorses and dwarf seahorses in the Indian River Lagoon in our area. You don't see them often because of our water quality issues, but they're native to Florida. Seahorses form wonderful pair bonds. I had a study site in the Loxahatchee River. I was doing some lionfish research at the time, and I was regularly surveying an area, and I saw the same pair of seahorses for months. They fall in love and they hang out together, being a little bit anthropomorphic there, but they form a great pond, bond. And every morning, the male and female will come together and they'll dance with each other. Sometimes that dance results in mating, sometimes it doesn't. It's just their courtship. But when they're ready to mate during that dance, the female will lay her eggs into the male's brood pouch. You have to look carefully. I'm going to play this again. The female will lay her eggs. See the male's brood pouch on the left is open. There she goes laying eggs. And just like that, they're done. Female's out of the picture now. The male fertilizes the eggs in his brood pouch, and he will carry them until they hatch, and they're ready to be released. Like other bottom nesting species, they have very big eggs, and as a result, they have very big babies. The babies that come out look like fully formed miniature seahorses. They don't go through that larval phase. Remember the angelfish larva I showed you and the bonefish larva? They go through a bizarre transformation where they go from this clear, barely fish-looking thing into a little tiny bonefish or a little tiny angelfish. In the case of seahorses, they look like seahorses from day one. Very high survival rate because they're big and all the investment that the parents put into raising them, very low dispersal. They, they can't drift anywhere. They go right down into the seagrass and they stay pretty close to mom and dad. Here's another video. I put two in here. This is such a cool process. I couldn't, couldn't do just one. He's literally going into labor, having contractions, and pushing them forcefully out of his brood pouch. There's another fish that is related to the seahorse called a pipefish, also abundant in Florida. We've got, off the top of my head, maybe a half dozen species that we see in this part of Florida. They don't have an elaborate pouch like a seahorse, but they still have a brood pouch. Usually it's like some folds of skin on the male's abdomen. And the male carries the eggs just like a seahorse. You can zoom in here and see all the eggs on the male's abdomen, and he'll carry them until they hatch. When they hatch, they're very well developed, fully formed, teeny tiny little pipefish. High parental investment, not a lot of eggs, but pretty big eggs, and as a result, babies that have a much higher survival rate. Now we're getting pretty weird. You think seahorse breeding is weird. Jawfish are really unusual. Jawfish produce a fairly small egg, not tiny, but not real big. And in order to keep that egg safe, the male carries them in his mouth for the entire gestation period. These are burrowing fish. If you've ever gone scuba diving at Blue Heron Bridge, you might have seen jawfish. This is a yellowhead jawfish. They're rare in Florida, but we see them from time to time. There's a couple of other species that aren't nearly as pretty, but they have the same behavior. And when it's time to mate, the female will go down into the burrow with the male. She lays her eggs, the male fertilizes them, and then immediately puts them in his mouth. And here's a video on the right of a male who just picked up a fresh egg mass, and you can see he'll spit it out and then grab it back in again. He's oxygenating it, he's rotating it. That egg mass is very light in color because it's fresh, it just got laid. As the babies develop, they get darker and darker. The one on the left, all the dark spots you see are the eyeballs of the baby jawfish developing. This is an example of very high parental investment. Here's why. Jawfish don't eat while they're carrying those eggs. So the male gives up eating for a period of time to ensure that his babies make it to the hatching stage. Because jawfish have pretty small eggs, their larvae are fairly small, so they still disperse reasonably well. And it's kind of like the best of both worlds. They're safer than a pelagic spawned egg, but they still have the ability to disperse, unlike most benthic spawned fish, so they have a, a decent survival rate. This is one version of mouth brooding. This is another. This one blows my mind. In Florida, we have two species of saltwater catfish. This one is called a hardhead catfish. We also have one called a gaff top sail catfish, and they're mouth brooders. And I, I remember, I didn't know this at one point in my life, and the reason I didn't know it, even as an avid angler, is because you'll never catch a catfish with eggs in its mouth. They're not going to eat. But one day, I snagged one by accident. And as I was unhooking it, I saw some really weird stuff in its mouth. And, and I was with another biologist friend of mine, and he's actually a fish reproductive biologist. And we both realized that we, we had a chance to witness mouth brooding 
in a catfish. These eggs are enormous. They're as big as marbles. Huge eggs. So we, we took a few out, we brought them back to the lab and put them in an artificial brooder and we got to watch the whole developmental cycle. Big eggs make enormous babies. These catfish babies are over an inch long when they're born. Obviously no dispersal, but very, very high survival rates. Unfortunately, the adult has to give up eating for the entire gestation period, so there is a big trade-off there. So far, we've talked about fish that don't have anatomy that looks anything like the mammalian anatomy. Now we're going to talk about a few that have structures that are a little bit more similar to what we're used to thinking about. They're not the same, but they do some of the same things as mammalian reproductive anatomy. First is the mosquito fish. Mosquito fish are common in our area. You find them in mangrove wetlands. You probably, if you live in a canal or a pond, you probably have little mosquito fish behind your house. And they have a structure, the males, called a gonopodium. It is a modified part of their anal fin, and it's hollow. And it works to deliver sperm into the female's body. So they have internal fertilization. They mate. They also have live birth. A few years ago, researchers discovered that female mosquito fish prefer to mate with males with longer gonopodia. <laughs> You're laughing. Well, the national media picked up on this, and this story made headlines all over the country in kind of a tongue-in-cheek, ha-ha sort of way. Given the choice, female mosquito fish like males with a larger gonopodium. We think it's a sign of nutrition. The, the more nutrition the male has, the bigger his gonopodium is. But there's a trade-off. Turns out that fish with a bigger gonopodium can't swim as fast and they get eaten by predators. <laughs> so if you're a mosquito fish in an area with no predators, certain little ponds in the Bahamas, the way, the way those ponds formed, there's no predatory fish in them. So if you're not worried about getting eaten by a predator, over time, females will select for males with a bigger gonopodium, and, and over time, the whole population will have a bigger gonopodium. That's called sexual selection. The opposite is natural selection. In places where there are predators, getting eaten by a predator because you have a larger gonopodium prevents you from passing your genes on to the next generation, and as a result, in those areas, the mosquito fish have smaller gonopodia. <laughs> kind of a funny story. Next. Sharks have anatomy that superficially might seem a little bit more mammalian as well. They have modified uh, pelvic fins that are called claspers. They're kind of like, I don't know, like a little fruit roll up on the end of the fin, and they have a groove that runs down the length of each clasper. That groove is what the shark uses, or the ray, uses to deliver sperm into the female shark or ray's body. So they also have live uh, birth sometimes, but sometimes they lay eggs as well. So it's internal fertilization, but that internal fertilization can then go in a couple of different directions. Sometimes live birth, sometimes egg laying. So if you've ever been to the Florida Oceanographic Coastal Center, you've noticed that we have a number of different ray species on exhibit. We also have some sharks. The next time you come out, I want you to look for claspers and see if you could tell whether you're looking at a, a male or a female ray or shark on exhibit. In the world of sharks and rays, Courtship is not very gentle. The male will typically bite the female, and that's why you'll see female sharks with terrible injuries on their body. Male sharks, for certain species, have pointier teeth, specifically for mating season. Females have much thicker skin. Now, the cool thing here is they heal so fast. We see mating injuries on some of the rays in our exhibit at the Coastal Center, and within a couple of weeks, they are healed with no scar left behind. So nature designed it to work this way. If you look in this picture, you can see the male's clasper is bent forward, and just one of them is delivering sperm into the female shark, and that is how fertilization occurs in most sharks and rays. The outcome of this sometimes is egg laying. Remember oviparity that we talked about earlier? We've gone from very tiny eggs to medium-sized eggs to the catfish eggs that are as big as a marble. Well, shark eggs are huge. Shark eggs can be two or three or four inches long. These are a couple of different species of shark egg, and inside of them, there's a big yolk that the shark, the shark puts into the egg capsule before it seals off. That yolk is where the baby shark gets its nutrition from. They have an umbilical cord, and they grow and grow and grow until they're ready to hatch. So a pretty big parental investment in terms of the amount of energy that goes into making the eggs, but once they lay the eggs, 
They just swim away. They don't guard them or care for them. They normally lay their eggs in underwater vegetation, either seagrass or algae, and the eggs have little tendrils that wrap around the vegetation and keep them in place. If you've ever found a mermaid's purse on the beach, that is an egg, usually of a skate. Here in Florida, the primary skate species that we have is called a clear nose skate. So if you find a little black mermaid's purse on the beach in our area, you're looking at an egg case from a clear nose skate. But not all sharks lay eggs. Some of them have live birth. Again, sort of mammalian. And in the world of live birth, there's a couple of different kinds of live birth. First is something called viviparity. This is true live birth where there's a placental connection to the mama's uterus. So if you look at this blue shark developing inside of a mama, there's an umbilical cord and a placenta. This is common in a lot of the sharks that we run into here in Florida, the requiem sharks, things like bull sharks, lemon sharks, black tip sharks, black nose sharks, spinner sharks. They use a placental development strategy after internal fertilization. The parent, the mother gives all that energy to the baby and they're born pretty large and pretty well developed. So high investment, but very high survival. But there's something between oviparity and viviparity called ovoviviparity. Another name for this is non-placental viviparity. These are animals that have live birth, but the mother doesn't have a placenta to give nutrition directly to the baby. Great white sharks do this. Nurse sharks do this. What they do is after fertilization, the eggs develop inside of the mother. They have a very thin membrane. They're not a hard egg, they're a soft egg. And eventually the babies hatch into the mother's uterus, but they stay inside for a while, growing off of their yolk sac. And there's a theory that certain ovoviviparous sharks produce something called uterine milk. I don't think I want a milkshake or ice cream made out of it, but if you're a baby shark, it's nutritious. It provides nutrients as well as fats and lipids to the developing sharks. And that's seen in ovoviviparity as a, as a means of giving nutrition to the next generation. I have a colleague who is very fortunate to be a part of a study that attempted to do an ultrasound on a wild pregnant tiger shark for the very first time. And this is a still image of what they saw. I'll show you a video in a second. But you can see the mouth of the shark and the nose of the shark. And as they scanned the shark, they found all of her babies, but no placenta because this is a non-placental example of live birth. Now I wanna tell you the video that I'm about to show, the first couple seconds, there's some lines drawn in for artistic purposes. This is not exactly what it looks like in real life. That's just to show you where the babies are, but watch, in a second, the lines will disappear. And now that's the real ultrasound of a pregnant tiger shark in the wild. This now allows researchers to see how many babies they have inside of them. In the past, the only way to know how many babies a tiger shark, for example, had inside of her was to kill her and cut her open. We don't do that anymore. So by having field ultrasound abilities, we're, we're able to, to look at this in detail without harming the animal. Now, this practice of ovoviviparity can get a little bit weird sometimes. I mentioned that the mother doesn't provide a placenta for her babies to grow. And usually it's the yolk that gives those developing babies their energy to, 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 to grow up and develop. But there are some examples of sharks that utilize something called inner uterine oophagy. Oophagy is a fancy word for egg eating. Mako sharks are a good example. In a mother mako shark, after her eggs are fertilized and start to develop, she'll make more eggs that are not fertilized. And the babies eat those eggs as they grow. This is a baby mako shark. This pouch on its belly looks like a yolk sac, but it's not. That's its stomach that's all distended out because it's been feasting on infertile eggs that its mother produces for it. This is a great way to give your offspring a ton of energy, but it's also a big investment on the mother's part to create all that fuel for her, her babies. They come out very well formed. This goes one step further. In sand tiger sharks, a practice called inner uterine cannibalism is employed. Fish uteruses have two branches, a left branch and a right branch. And in the sand tiger shark, the first egg to hatch in each side of the uterus starts to grow very quickly. And they begin to eat their younger siblings. The shark facing to the right is a developing sand tiger shark. It's the biggest one in that side of the mother shark's uterus. 
The shark on the left is its little sibling. That's the size that the larger sibling will gobble up. Once the larger sibling eats all of its younger siblings, it will begin eating additional eggs that the mother produces. And as a result, sand tiger sharks will produce two very well-formed pups. The gestation period for these internal reproducing sharks and rays can be very long. It depends on the species, but there are some examples of gestation periods that last in excess of a year. If you've been to the coastal center and touched our cow nose stingrays, they typically have one pup at a time, and their gestation period can be nine to 10 months. So very, very caring parents. All right, the last topic we're gonna to talk about today shifts away from the mechanism of reproduction and talks a little bit more about the, the actual roles that the individual sexes play. And fish don't always necessarily play by by the normal mammalian rules that you and I are used to thinking of. In the fish world, many species are called gonochoristic. That just means that they're born with one sex and they will stay that sex for the remainder of their life. But even within fish that are normally gonochoristic, like this Chinook salmon, sometimes things happen and they end up being hermaphrodites. This fish has a fully formed set of ovaries and a fully formed set of testes in it, even though it's not typically a hermaphroditic species. But there are other species of fish that are normally hermaphroditic, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. How do we know that fish change sex throughout their life? It's pretty easy. You take a tiny specimen of their gonads and put it under a microscope, and if you capture it at just the right time, you can see tissue that is ovarian and tissue that is testicular at the exact same time. So when you look at this under a microscope and you're a fish histopathologist, which I'm not, you can immediately tell that you're looking at a fish that has both a male capability and a female capability at some point during its life. Within the world of hermaphroditism, there are a couple of different variants. One is sequential hermaphroditism. These are fish that are born one sex, something triggers them to change to another, and they stay that other sex for the rest of their life. And the triggers depend on the species. And even within this, there are two different variants. First is protogeny. Protogenous hermaphrodites start out as female and then become male. And there's different triggers for this. In the case of gag grouper, a very common fish in Florida, if you've had a grouper sandwich, you've probably eaten gag grouper, they are all born female. And when they reach a certain size or a certain age, they will transition or transform to become males. And we think the reason that the really big ones are males has to do with how they reproduce. They form in, in certain species, not all species, but in certain species, the males form a, a breeding structure where the, the biggest male maybe is more attractive to the female. So in this particular species, the females start out life breeding as, as a, an egg producer, and then they transform into a male, but then the males are still breeding with the female. So it's, it's a really neat twist, and it's only one example of sequential hermaphroditism. The trigger is size. Here's another example of a protogenous hermaphrodite, female first, that doesn't use size as a trigger. It uses a social behavioral cue. These are blue-headed wrasses. The male is the larger fish with the blue head and the green body. The females are the smaller yellow ones. So the blue-headed wrasse has a unique reproductive sh uh, social structure. They form a harem. One, whoop, one male blue-head wrasse has a group of females that he'll mate with, and he works so hard to chase away other males. He invests a ton of energy into chasing other males away to keep his harem together. And in order to do a better job of that, he is the bigger gender. So in this species, the size of the big male is, is what allows him to successfully protect his harem. If he were to die, one of his mates would very quickly turn into a male. Within a week, her ovarian tissue would shrivel, testes would grow, and she would start to outwardly look like a dominant male. But there's another twist. In bluehead wrasses, there is a dominant male, but there's also a subordinate male called a sneaker male. 
They're born male. They look almost identical to the females. And when the male is out chasing other males away, he doesn't notice that the sneaker male is in his harem. And those sneaker males will reproduce right under the eyes of the dominant male. If a male dies, sometimes the sneaker male will become the dominant male without any sex change. So female first, but with a behavioral cue instead of a size cue. And then the opposite of protogeny is protandry. Protandrous hermaphrodites start out as male and become female. So snook are a great example. All snook are born boys. And when they reach a certain size, almost all of them become female. In this case, because their mating structure is pretty simple, they don't, they don't have territories, they don't, you know, they don't preferentially mate with the biggest individual. The priority here is making lots of eggs. So a giant female snook is able to produce a whole lot of eggs, and that is the reason why they switch sex. In this case, the whole goal is to produce more offspring, and with snook, by being larger as females, they're able to produce massive, massive amounts of eggs. But this creates some management challenges. If any of you like to fish, for most species, you know that to take a fish home for dinner, it has to be bigger than a certain size. But if we'd use that model for snook, we'd be taking home the big females that are laying all the eggs. So instead, fisheries managers for species that undergo sex change like this utilize something called a slot limit. There's a minimum size limit, meaning you can't keep the little tiny fish. We want to give them a chance to reach maturity. But you can't keep the really big fish either because they're the ones that are going to provide eggs for the next generation. So you're only allowed to keep fish that are in the middle. And in the case of snook, the slot limit is right around the size where you'd have the biggest males turning into the smallest females. So that size has the smallest impact on the next generation of snook populations. But like we said before, not all sex change is driven by size. Sometimes it's driven by behavior. In the case of clownfish, they are protandrous hermaphrodites. They are born male, and they transform into females at a certain point in life. They also maintain a social hierarchy when they're breeding. It's not really a harem, but it, it has harem-like characteristics. In nature, one large female clownfish will partner up with one spawning male clownfish. But they'll also have a bunch of other small clownfish around them that are male, but not reproductive. They don't breed. They hang out together. They're not enemies. They don't chase them off. They're not sneaker males, but they don't breed. If the large female clownfish were to die, the male that was breeding sized will turn into the female, and then one of the smaller males will reach maturity and become his mate. So there's a problem. Finding Nemo, Finding Nemo didn't quite get it right. So let me refresh all of your memories. I had to look this up because I haven't watched Finding Nemo in years. Nemo starts out with Nemo's father and mother guarding a nest of eggs. Remember, they nest on the bottom. They're great parents. And Nemo's mom gets eaten by a barracuda. Now, thankfully, because Nemo's dad is a great parent, he guarded Nemo's nest. Nemo still hatched. And because clownfish have very large eggs, Nemo survived. Also, remember that those large babies don't drift away very far, so Nemo stuck close to home. So far, we're accurate. Nemo's dad, Nemo, everything's great. But in nature, if that same scenario played out a little bit further, Nemo's dad would have turned into a female. And assuming that Nemo hadn't drifted away to another area, Nemo would have matured to be the reproductive male in that pair. I know why we didn't learn about this in the cartoon. So that's direction, that's, that's gender change or sex change that goes in one direction and never goes back. But there are some very rare examples of fish that can go back and forth and back and forth. This is called bidirectional sex change. Historically, it was only identified in a few species of goby, like these little Catalina gobies. And in this species, they all start out as girls, they become boys, but then based on social dominance, they can switch back to being females. We think what happens is the boldest individuals are male, 
And if a bold male interacts with a less bold male, it'll make that male switch back to being female. Now, I just talked to one of my friends this morning who's a, like a world's leading expert in this stuff, and what he told me was, was fantastic. We're starting to learn more about this process, and it turns out there are more species that do this than we realized. It's, it's occurring more and more frequently. It's just really hard to identify. It's hard to catch that moment of back and then forth and then back again. But there are more and more fish species that appear to be able to change sex more than once in their lifetime. And then we have simultaneous hermaphrodites. These are fish that have both ovaries and testes at the same time. The best example of a simultaneous hermaphrodite in our area is the hamlet. There's a bunch of different hamlet species that we see on local reefs. They're really colorful little fish. They're related to grouper. They're not in the grouper family, but they're related. And they are able to produce both eggs and sperm simultaneously, but they cannot fertilize their own eggs. They have to mate with another simultaneous hermaphrodite hamlet. I've seen this. It's really amazing. They, they meet each other. And the cool thing here is any two will do. If a hamlet runs into another hamlet of the same species, it knows that it can breed with that individual. They do a little dance right at sunset, and then they start a spawning rise. And you can see the spawning rise on the left here. One fish will release eggs, the other will release sperm. And they'll go back down to the bottom and hang out for a little bit, and then they'll do another one. And the same fish that laid eggs before will, will do it again. And this happens a few times until she's out of eggs. And then they switch roles. And the one that was a male a minute ago will start laying eggs as a female. Pretty amazing adaptation. It's great if you want to make sure that every time you run into somebody in your own species, you can reproduce. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. This is one of my favorite little fish. It's the mangrove rivulus. It is found in Martin County. It's only about that big, and it has a unique distinction. It is the only self-fertilizing, simultaneously hermaphroditic vertebrate on Earth. This fish produces eggs and sperm, but unlike the hamlet, it can fertilize its own eggs. And the reason it does that is because of where it lives. This little fish in Florida lives in stagnant water, in mangrove marshes, in wetlands, but primarily it's found at the very bottom of crab burrows. You know those giant land crabs that we see in the summer crossing the road? At the bottom of their burrows, there's a puddle of water, and that is where the mangrove rivulus lives. They are so durable that if that burrow dries out, they could stay out of the water for weeks, just sitting in wet mud or curling up under a leaf. And it's a nice, safe home for them, but the problem is, if you're trying to find a date, living in the bottom of a crab burrow is not ideal. <laughs> so they're able to fertilize their own eggs, and then they flip out of the water, lay their eggs in the mud around the burrow or under a leaf or under some bark, and those eggs can last for quite a while, and they're waiting for a big tide to come along to sweep the eggs away, at which point they hatch, and the next generation begins. What's interesting, though, is in Central America, the same species is found in little puddles. Not big puddles, but bigger than a crab burrow. And instead of just one individual, there's, there's multiple individuals in those puddles. And in those populations, in addition to the, the hermaphrodites, there are males. And we think the purpose of those males is to create more genetic diversity. In the case of the mangrove rivulus in Florida, because they're using their own sperm to fertilize their own eggs, there's very little genetic variability. In Central America, where these fish have a better chance of bumping into each other in little shallow puddles, by having some males involved, they're able to increase their, their um, genetic diversity. So mangrove rivulets have a hard time finding babies, and they deal with that through, through this self-fertilizing simultaneous hermaphroditism. But there are also some animals, particularly sharks and rays, they can reproduce without any fertilization at all. This is called parthenogenesis. And essentially, in, in these cases, the mother is able, and there's a few different ways she does this, but she's basically able to take an egg without fertilizing it and make it start to develop into an offspring. Most often, we hear about this on the nightly news. This was, on the right, was an article that I saw just a couple days ago from a Carolina aquarium, North Carolina aquarium, about a ray that had never met a boy and yet was pregnant with pups. So normally this occurs in a captive setting. Unfortunately, it seems like the offspring of parthenogenesis don't do as well as ones that are produced naturally, but it is a neat strategy. And then my final story, 
If you really have a hard time finding a mate, you might have to resort to sexual parasitism. There's a group of fish called anglerfish. Anglerfish are cool. You've probably seen these somewhere, either on TV or in a sculpture. They're the ones that have the little fishing rod on their forehead that they jiggle around as a lure to attract their prey. There are tons of different types of anglerfish, but there are certain species that are considered deep sea anglerfish. And those species live under thousands and thousands of feet of water, and they have a hard time finding mates. Their mates are very, very small. A male deep sea anglerfish might be a hundredth or a thousandth of the mass of a female. And the way the female attracts the males is by releasing pheromones into the water. The males smell the female, follow that stream, and when they find her, they bite onto her. And in some species, after they bite on, their lips fuse to her body, her bloodstream fuses to his, his fins shrivel, and he basically withers away to nothing but a set of testes that the female now has control over. <laughs> and, and sometimes, you know, in this case, there's one on the bottom here, there's one parasitic male, but sometimes you'll see three or four just kind of stuck on the different parts of the body of the female. This way, anytime the female is ready to lay eggs, she has a male who's just there for the ride. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me tonight. I hope that... I hope that turned into a more interesting story than you thought. I do want to leave this QR code up during our question and answer session. You can use your phone to connect to that advocacy website I mentioned. But for the next couple minutes, I'd love to try to answer any questions that you might have. I'll start out with our audience here at the Blake, and if I have time, I'll go to our online audience as well. Yes? Yes, so the question is about the bonefish spawning work that Bonefish and Tarpon Trust led in the Bahamas, and I was very fortunate to be a part of that for, for a number of years. That work, BTT has continued to do it, and, and they've done an amazing job, not just protecting the site that I worked at, but they've now found these spawning aggregations on a number of different Bahamian islands, and they've, they've worked with the Bahamian government to try to advise them of the value of those places, and they have created national parks, not just at the site that I got to work at, the first one we found, but some of the other subsequent sites. And even better, they've been taking that knowledge and trying to use it in the Florida Keys to figure out where Florida bonefish are spawning. And just this year, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust announced that they found a spawning aggregation in the Florida Keys. So I would encourage you to visit Bonefish and Tarpon Trust's website. They've got lots of videos, uh, short documentaries that talk a lot more about that work. The, yes, the question is what island I did the work at. The, the island I worked on was Abaco, and we found this, the very first spawning site was, was on Abaco. Now they've found them on a bunch of other islands. Thank you. Yes, buddy. How do you get the tags? How do you get the tags into the fish? What a great question. So normally when I tag fish, like the snook I told you about, I do a little surgery on them. I cut them open, put the tag in, sew them back, oop, hang on, sew them back up. But we found that if you do that right before a fish spawns, they're not going to spawn. So for the spawning bonefish, we use something called a gastric tag. It goes into their stomach. We have a plunger, and we put the tag in their mouth and plunger it down into their esophagus. They're able to regurgitate it back up after a couple of days, but while it's in their stomach, we let them go right away, and they go right about business as usual, and that's how we're able to track them. Good question. Next question. Yes? So when the angler males bite the angler females, and they draw the blood from the females, does that the Oh, good question. So when a male anglerfish bites onto the female, why does he wither? I don't know. That might be a question you could solve when you grow up to be a scientist. It's, it's not just that he like, drinks her blood. The anglerfish male's blood supply becomes connected to her blood supply. So it might just be that without a, without a need to feed, he doesn't really need all those other body parts, and he just sort of withers away. It's almost like I know when I broke my arm when I was little and I didn't use it for a long time, when it came out of the cast, A, it was smelly, and B, it was kind of wrinkly and small because I hadn't used it in so long. Maybe that's the same thing that happens with anglerfish males. Good question. Any other questions? 
Oh, yes, sir. Let me let me check with this gentleman here first. Yes, sir. What an interesting question. So the St. Lucie estuary has been bombarded with pollution for a really long time. Is that favoring any species? And off the top of my head, I really don't think it is. I think most of the species that are meant to be in our estuary thrive in pristine, clear water, the kind of water that Mark remembers from his childhood. And most of the species that are still hanging on are just barely hanging on because their, their physiology allows them to manage but not thrive. There are other species that are, are literally on the verge of disappearing, at least locally, when we have these big discharges. Fish like snook can handle low salinity. They can handle murky water. So the discharges hurt them, but don't destroy them. Other fish that are more sensitive, things like um, seahorses and pipefish, and, and I know this is not a fish, but conch. Conch cannot handle low salinity. So when we have a discharge like we're dealing with right now, the conch that sometimes live out on the sandbar in the mouth of the St. Lucie, they die. And that's a protected species. So I don't think there's anything that's taking advantage of the bad conditions, unfortunately. I wish there was. Yes, in the back. At the end, you mentioned something about the rays having virgin birth. Yeah. Are those pups, are they genetically natural or just born? Great question. So the question is about parthenogenesis. The rays and sharks that are able to have virgin birth without mating, are the babies haploid or diploid? They're diploid. So what happens, I, I, I kind of alluded to, there's a couple different mechanisms, but the simple explanation is either the female produces an egg that doesn't undergo meiosis, so it, it's a diploid egg, or somehow they're able to, to recombine two halves and create a, a, a full genome and, and it's, that's diploid. Good question. Any other questions? Did you have a, yep. Yeah. That big that lady would be my wife. <laughs> the, the question was about the snook photo. I, I, I have to show off my, my wonderful and talented significant other. She catches more big snook than I do, and if I'm gonna put a snook picture in a presentation, it better be it better be Sam. Yes, Mark. Zach, we've noticed uh, spawning aggregations of spotted sea trout the same Yep. Yeah, so when we look at fish spawning, remember how tiny those pelagic eggs are? And I said they're very fragile, they're very delicate. Salinity can have a huge impact on them. So when we look at like Dr. Grant Gilmore's work in the mouth of the St. Lucie and up near Hell's Gate that shows that that's a critical spawning spot for spotted sea trout, those sea trout are, are going there because naturally the salinity would be just right. They spawn in the springtime. We're getting discharges this spring. There's a chance that the entire year class of spotted sea trout that spawn in the St. Lucie will get wiped out because the water's too fresh for their eggs to survive in. Remember, fresh water floats on top of salt water. Remember that marine fish eggs float. So even if the bottom is salty enough for things like oysters to, to hang on, floating fish eggs are not gonna make it. And this has become such a problem that we really don't see many sea trout in our estuary anymore. The spots that they've spawned in in the past have been so degraded by freshwater discharges and the loss of seagrass, which is where their babies spend their nursery years, that you know, once abundant fish species like sea trout are no longer common in our estuary. I'm gonna take a look at some Zoom questions real quick. We've got just a few minutes left. Somebody has a question about the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust study. They're wondering whether those results have been published. Absolutely, BTT has published multiple peer-reviewed papers. And each year, you know, the work that, that I was working with them on 12, 13 years ago has evolved and, and they've got more and more papers coming out right up until the most recent year with the study where they documented spawning in the Oh, I think, did I just get cut? No, I'm back. Um, so yes, there are peer-reviewed publications and you can go online and read those. Somebody also has a question about clownfish. Is there such a thing as a true female clownfish from birth or are they all born male? And that's a good question. I'd have to look that one up, but I'm pretty sure that they are all born male and they only become female via that, that sex change process. Let's see here. Sorry, I have to read through these. Lots of comments, not a lot of questions. Ah, here's a good one. If you find a shark or a skate egg case on the beach, should you return it to the water? 
Here's the good news. Most of the time, you could take that home and put it with your seashell collection. We don't normally find them on the beach until they've hatched out. When they're still viable and there's a little baby shark or skate in that mermaid's purse, they're, they're tangled up in vegetation underwater, like I mentioned, and they don't typically break free and wash up on the beach until after they've hatched. So you can bring that home as a souvenir. And let's see here. Uh, regarding parthenogenesis, are all the offspring female? Good question. For most species that I know of, yes. But it really depends. Uh, another group of animals that utilize parthenogenesis quite often are the amphibians. And I do know that for salamanders that utilize parthenogenesis, they are all female populations. And let's see, are there any marine fish that engage in extended parental care? I guess I don't know exactly what extended would be. Uh, I think I gave you examples that, that would be extended in the world of marine fish, considering that most marine fish just walk away from their babies. So like jawfish, they care for them for a while, clownfish, the mouth brooding fish like the catfish, but that's about it. There aren't many examples of marine fish that will take care of their offspring much beyond hatching. In freshwater, there are some examples of fish that will continue to guard their nest after the babies are born. Cichlids and tilapia are good examples. But in the marine world, I, I could be wrong on this, but I think just about the, the extreme limit of parental care is what we talked about tonight. I will give you time for one more question if we have one. If not, oh, I got one in the back. We'll finish up with your question, sir. <laughs> Perfect. What are the snook biting on from a fisherman's perspective? I can't tell you that. You'll go catch all the snook. <laughs> Folks, thank you for coming out tonight. Please, please come back next week. We have a very important presentation all about the archaeological history of the Florida Everglades. Sarah's a great speaker, and it's a really cool topic. Please come back again. And for those of you who joined us for your first time tonight, make sure you become a regular. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter, and make sure you join the Florida Oceanographic Society family. Good night, everybody. Thank you.